Hi, my name is Eric Never, Vice President of Thomson Reuters DT Tax and Accounting. Welcome to the 10th anniversary edition of Synergy Canada. Yes, it's already been 10 years since our first edition with the late Michael Bussey as guest speaker. Time flies and I'm thrilled to be there 10 years later to welcome longtime clients as well as new users of the DT Professional Suite. Once again this year, we're offering you a rich and varied program, including everything you need to take a head start on the upcoming tax season. Thank you for your trust. I'm delighted to start the day with you. So without further ado, let's take a look at my presentation. I'll cover the following topics. Artificial intelligence, new features in DT Max and the DT Professional Suite, audio firm management and audio tax, the Learning Center and Advisory Services. I'll wrap it up with an update on a few selected topics. At this time last year, neither you nor I had any idea of what was about to turn the world upside down just a few weeks later. With the advent of ChatGPT, a whole new world of disruption was upon us. Artificial intelligence, or AI, took a giant leap forward and caught many people and companies off guard. The five-year plans of many large organizations, including our own, have gone out the window in 2023 to be adapted to the new reality of AI and its yet-to-be-defined potential. So you can imagine that Thomson Reuters has taken steps over the past year to start positioning itself to benefit from the potential of artificial intelligence in our products. One of these is a study on how AI is the catalyst for transforming all aspects of work. To learn more, we wanted to hear directly from professionals. We surveyed 1,200 professionals in North and South America and in the UK to better understand AI impact on their businesses, talent, customers, and environment. These professionals think AI, tech, and automation will have by far the most significant impact on their business in the next five years. They think AI will create new professional career paths, improve productivity, result in better advisory services, and create a demand for responsible AI. The adoption of AI tools, including generative AI, in tax and accounting is still relatively new, but it's growing at a pretty steady pace. Here are some of the ways that tax and accounting customers of all sizes are using Gen AI tools in their practices. Small businesses are using it for automating time-consuming and repetitive tasks such as data entry, invoice processing, and expense categorization. Medium businesses are using it to improve accuracy of accounting and tax work by identifying and correcting errors, save time by automating tasks, improve customer service by using chatbots that can answer client questions and provide support. And large corporations are leveraging AI to gain insights into data to analyze large amounts of data to identify trends and patterns. Here are just some of Thomson Reuters AI initiatives taken in recent months. Commitment to invest 100 million a year in AI capabilities, launch of a partnership with Microsoft 365 Copilot, acquisition of case techs, launch of Westlaw Precision Gen AI skill. For this last point, Thomson Reuters is set to make a new generative AI skill available in Westlaw Precision later this month. Using the new skill named Westlaw Precision AI Assisted Research, customers will be able to ask complex questions in conversational language and quickly receive synthesized answers. Beyond its commercial applications, AI is also helping to improve the way we work, whether it's for recommending new services or products to customers, for programming assistance in software development, for staff training, or for a better understanding of our customers. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. AI potential is huge. Artificial intelligence is now a fact of life, and it's hard to predict today how things will evolve and how quickly over the next few years. 
That being said, Thomson Reuters is determined to be a leader in AI, and we can expect our investments to have positive impacts on software support, research and new product development, interactions with our customers, and much more. Let's move on to the changes we have in store for the DT Professional Suite. DT Max's client letter is a key tool for serving your customers. With that in mind, our team has developed a new interface for making changes to the client letter. This is simply an additional tool at your disposal if you wish to make changes. Otherwise, you can continue to follow the same procedure as in previous years. You can launch the client letter assistant via the advanced utilities menu. The assistant offers several possibilities. The most popular will be most likely to choose a letter template and then adapt it to your liking using the utilities feature. In the example on the screen, I'm using the letter without installments as a starting point. Once the content of the letter is displayed, you can browse it or use the search function to go directly to a word. In my example, I did a search for the word child. The menu on the left gives you two choices for displaying the additions available for the letter that is displayed by variables like here or by sections. The screen on the right allows you to view the letter's existing variables via the edit mode. From there, you can right click where you want to make a change in the client letter to add a variable. You can then view the new client letter using the preview client letter mode. Speaking of preview, if you would like to learn more about the Client Letter Assistant, don't miss DT Max's new Productivity Features Workshop at 3.30 p.m. this afternoon. My colleague Jerry will take a few minutes to demonstrate examples on how to make changes to the Client Letter using the utility. In the same workshop, you'll also see examples of how to use the new keyword group to review and track the tax workflow. In short, it's a way for the tax preparer to keep track of the questions to ask their client when preparing the tax return. This keyword can be used for the individual, their spouse, or a dependent. In my example, I chose the question, sold the principal residence, and I entered date and proceeds in the question detail keyword. Once my client has answered the question, I can return to the keyword group and indicate the information received. So I've entered the sale price and date, along with a brief explanation. I can also add the date on which my customer replied and select yes to the completed keyword once I have manually entered the data in the relevant keywords. The in-house tax review questions form allows you to display the tax review questions in the tax return window. You may have had clients in the past who had a staggering number of T5008s to download from the CRA's Autofill My Return service. In the vast majority of cases, DT Max supports the download of this data. But there are exceptions where there is simply too much data to complete the download. To remedy this situation, we've added a feature to the software that automatically generates a CSV file when this happens. I'll explain how the CSV file works in a moment, but it's also possible to tell DTMAX in the miscellaneous section of users defaults that you would rather generate the CSV file always when there are more than 10 T5008 slips, more than 20 or more than 50. So following the download, the T1 autofill keyword group will be displayed on the right side of the data entry screen along with the other tax data downloaded from the CRA. Next, copy the T1 autofill keyword group to the left-hand side of the data entry screen. The keyword AFR T5008 file name contains the path of the archive CSV file. Click the icon indicated by the arrow on this slide to open it. This file provides data for the T5008 slip. It will have the .csv extension, generally recognized by most spreadsheet software on the market. If this is the case, by clicking on the icon, the spreadsheet software, Excel for instance, should normally open with the received data ready to receive your calculations. It is then preferable to save any modifications or additional calculations to a file in the native format of this software. So for Excel, you want to save it as an 
XLS file like in this example. Starting April 1st, 2023, potential first time home buyers can open a home savings account to save up to $8,000 a year toward the purchase of a qualifying home. Upon contribution, your client will receive a T4F HSA and a Relevé 32 in Quebec. An amount will also be indicated in box 20 if a withdrawal was made during the year. It is not mandatory to deduct the full amount in the year of contribution. The FHSA to deduct keyword allows you to limit the amount of the deduction. The new Schedule 15 allows you to track your customers' FHSA contributions, transfers, and activities. Here, line 19 shows the amount of unused FHSA contributions available for deduction in future years. Finally, the FHSA deduction is carried to the calculation of taxable income in the same way as an RRSP deduction. Carry forwards to 2024 can also be viewed on the screen under the FH, FHSA keyword group. 2023 marks the end of the temporary flat rate method for calculating employment expenses. Leaving aside the exceptions, this means that your customers who spend more than 50% of their time working from home will have, to will have to provide you with all the information you need to calculate their employment expenses for salaried employees. I can sense your enthusiasm for this task. This is no picnic. Also new for 2023, the 2022 federal budget introduced a new deeming rule to ensure that profits from the disposition of residential real estate that has been held for less than 365 days are taxed as business income, unless an exception applies. The flipping property keyword has been added to the capital gains keyword group to indicate where applicable a property flipping. Field 17905 has been added to Schedule 3 to indicate a property flipping. And on the same page, you'll find a list of life events that are exceptions to this new rule. This list includes, among others, the death or serious illness of the taxpayer or a related person, a separation, an involuntary termination of employment, and the taxpayer's insolvency. In summary, a property flipping for which at least one life event applies will generate a capital gain. Otherwise, you will have to include the profits from the flipping as income in a business group. DTMAX will automatically generate a diagnostic if a property flipping is present in a capital gains group and no corresponding income is detected in a business group. In response to a suggestion from a T2 preparer, we've added a new keyword to the training CRQ keyword group for expenses relating to a trainee for the Quebec training credit. As a matter of fact, the information entered in the trainee week keyword concerning the trainee's training week is mostly the same from one week to the next. For this reason, the new copy train week keyword lets you enter the number of the week you want to copy so you don't have to re-enter the same information. You can then make the necessary changes and additions. Bill C-32 received royal assent on December 15, 2022, introducing new tax return filing and information reporting requirements for trust. Previously, a trust that had no activity during the year and no income tax payable was not required to file a T-3 return. However, for taxation years after December 30th, 2023, certain trusts, including bear trusts that were not required to file a T3 return under the old rules, will now be required to do so. These new reporting rules require the following trust to report additional information about their stakeholders. All non-resident trusts currently required to file a T3 return, express trust resident in Canada with some uh, exceptions, and bear trust arrangements. A trust will be subject to a new penalty if it fails to comply with the new disclosure rules. The penalty is the greater of 2,500 or 5% of the maximum fair market value of the property held by the trust during the taxation year. 
the Quebec government has announced that it would harmonize with the new federal requirements for trust effective as of the same date. If option testamentary is selected under the trust keyword and keyword trust type is not a graduated rate estate or a qualified disability trust, then a warning message will be generated if the keyword file then ownership has not been entered. The same principle applies to an inter vivo trust, except that there are more types of trust that are exempt from the new trust information reporting requirements. The keyword file ban ownership must be entered to indicate the jurisdiction to which the stakeholder information should be reported to. In the same keyword group, you will be able to indicate whether this is the first time you're providing the, benef the beneficial ownership info or if there has been a change in the beneficial ownership info. Based on the jurisdiction, DTMAX will automatically generate the applicable keywords in the following affected keyword groups, trustee, settler, beneficiary, and control entity. As the reporting rules differ between the CRA and Revenue Quebec, the user must enter the information with two distinct keywords for federal and Quebec jurisdictions. More, specific, more specifically, federally scheduled 15 must be filed annually with the trust return. However, previously reported entities will be carried forward by the CRA and thus not required to be re-entered unless there is a modification like in the example on this slide. You can see that the keyword Ben Own Info has the option Modify Reportable Entity Selected, which entails that Part B and C of Schedule 15 need to be completed as well. Note that DTMAX will carry forward the keyword information. Finally, unlike the CRA, Omni Quebec requires that the entities be reported yearly. These keywords will be carried forward with the same option from year to year. As such, it is important that you verify all these keywords on an annual basis to be sure the information is correct for the applicable tax year. We're now taking a step towards the clouds with our web-based solutions from the OnView suite. The comparative summary is now available in OnView Tax. Just as in DTMAX, it includes up to five years for comparison purposes and support T1 and TP1. It's now possible to assign a contact person for tax matters to the family unit. Simply select option assign as tax matters contact for the desired family member. Two things happen when you designate a tax matters contact. Access privileges to other family members' tax records are granted to the selected family member in OnView documents. This family member becomes the tax matters contact in OnView Center for all family members. In doing so, he or she will be able to send or receive documents on behalf of the entire family and client center. For instance, to consult returns from other family members. Note that it's always possible to remove or change the family tax matters contact later in the tax season if necessary. Participants in the early adopter program have told us about the need to be able to send all tax forms to be signed to one person in the family unit, just like with DTMAX and OnView for management. It's now possible to do this in OnView Tax, bearing in mind, however, that the best practice is for each client to receive their own electronic signature request. That being said, if you use this feature, make sure to change the name for the document signature to the name of the person who needs to sign, as the recipient's name will appear in the document by default. Once the request has been sent, e-file cannot take place until your customer's signature has been received. The request is sent to the client center and expires after seven days. After this period, a new request must be sent to your client. So here we can see the before and after. At the top, we can see that the return has not been e-filed, while at the bottom, you can see that the client has signed their T1 ED3 and that the federal e-file status has been automatically updated by OnView to reflect that. With PDF pairing, it's now possible to combine multiple PDF files into a single PDF. Simply select the Combine PDF option from the Manage menu.
I then select the client documents I wish to pair to create and name my new combined PDF file. Thanks to a seamless integration with Onio for management, you can set up online payments through Stripe for your clients. Coming soon, Onio for management will provide new notifications to staff members, namely project task routing notifications and staff notifications when invoice is paid via client center. Here we can see an example of a project task routing notification. Another new feature in the works is the ability to fill in PDF documents available in the client center. Several of our Onvio customers are asking for this. Last year, I told you about the launch of the Learning Center, our sleek portal for accessing DTMAX training and firm management packages. Access to the Learning Center is quick and easy via our cloud-based portal. You can access it at any time simply by entering your username and password. Content is customized based on your subscription, and the Learning Center offers detailed tracking of your training journey. This makes it much easier to implement your learning plans at your own pace. One year after its launch, the Learning Center now offers a wide range of training packages enabling new customers to start off on the right foot with their new DT product. And that's not all. Firms wishing to train new employees or deepen their expertise can renew their one-year access to the Learning Center by opting for one of our continued learning packages. To help new Onvio users get up to speed during their learning curve, we're offering office hours for questions to our experts. This service is aimed at all our customers who are in the process of implementing the essential or advanced versions of Onvio firm management in the Learning Center. Participants also have the opportunity to meet other accounting firms implementing Onvio. This way, they can exchange knowledge and discuss best office practices. This is just an overview of the services we offer. To learn more, I invite you to watch the short video titled The Learning Center, available in the bonus content section of the Synergy platform. You can also visit the Customer Success Boot to meet Emmy and Jerry, two of our main content creators for the Learning Center. Practice Forward offers tools and personalized coaching designed to enhance your firm's advisory services and strengthen relationships with your clients. You can now learn more about this innovative program by visiting our website. On average, firms taking part in the Practice Forward program increase their monthly billings by 150% for existing clients and by 200% for new clients in the months following the program's implementation. The program works simply. You're given access to a roadmap that includes proposal temp templates, pricing calculators, and checklists. On top of that, our consultant works with you to help implement and execute a proven sales process, identify and package your firm's services, develop a pricing strategy, standardize firm best practices for consulting services, transition existing clients to advisory-based relationships, identify advisory opportunities for your clients. If you want to learn more about successful advisory strategies, I suggest that you attend the 2.30 p.m. workshop given by my colleague David on the keys to successfully integrating your new clients. Here's a mishmash of topics before turning it over to our friends from CRA. Speaking of CRA, the Canada Revenue Agency will pilot a new automatic tax filing system in February. The goal is to help vulnerable Canadians who don't file their taxes get their benefits. In effect, based on a 2020 rep report from Carleton University, 10 to 12% of Canadians don't file their taxes. Most of these non-filers are low-income tax preparers and taxpayers, sorry, and they are missing out on nearly two billions worth of government rebates and programs annually. The government wants to fix that, and for the same reason, CRA is expanding their file my return service allowing hundreds of thousands of Canadians to file their tax return by answering a series 
of simple questions over the phone. The goal is to triple the uptake on that program to 2 million people annually by 2025. Revenue Quebec is also going to test a way to ensure citizens on low incomes file their tax returns. The digital pilot project will likely offer pre-filled tax returns to a targeted clientele consisting mainly of people who are vulnerable or have a simple tax situation according to information the agency has in its records. Revenu Québec expects to reach out to up to 100,000 citizens with this pilot. All in all, we can expect both the CRA and Revenu Québec to adopt a cautious phase approach in the upcoming years, broadening the target clientele based on the results and experience gained through each tax season. Among the comments received by Synergy participants last year, some of you expressed an interest in learning more about OnVio tax in a more interactive or, if you prefer, participative setting. With that in mind, this year, our team is offering you the opportunity to register for OnVio tax days. As a Synergy participant, you'll have the opportunity to spend one hour with our team in mid-January, during which you'll have the chance to try out Onvio Tax by yourself. Our experts will be on hand to guide you and answer any questions you may have. Visit the Onvio booth today to find out more about Onvio Tax Days and hopefully sign up. That's all I have for uh, you guys this morning. Uh, we've got a very rich program for you for the rest of the day. Uh, it goes like this, CRA updates on digital services and the T2 program. What's new from our friends at Revenu Québec? Then we're going to go for a short break. It's going to be followed by a tax update presented by our very own Jerry Vitoratos. Then it uh, will be time to go for our lunch break starting at 12.30 uh, p.m. Uh, during this uh, two-hour period, you'll have the opportunity to visit our virtual booths, or take a peek at the bonus content from the Synergy platform. The afternoon kicks off in style with a tough choice to make between two very interesting workshops. The first, led by Amy Valme, is about preparing for tax season with Onvio Firm Management and its integration with DT Max. And the second, led by David Caron, is about integrating your new clients. At 3.30 p.m., Jerry Vitoratos will take all the time needed to introduce you to DT Max's new productivity features and give you an overview of the content available in the Learning Center. Once again this year, we're offering several short presentations as a bonus. They are available today or later if you're running out of time at the end of the day. The same goes for all presentations which means you'll be able to catch up if you're interested in both 2.30 p.m. workshops. Thank you for attending this morning. I hope you enjoy my opening address, and I'll see you at 4.30 p.m. for the closing remarks and the draw for participation prices. Thank you, Eric, for the official launch of Synergy 2023. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome. My name is Jérôme and I will be helping you navigate throughout the day. I would like to start off by saying thank you to Eric and his team for making this event possible. Once again this year, Eric and his team are committed to delivering the best content as well as the latest news and updates from the tax and accounting industry. Some housekeeping items for today. To navigate between the general sessions, the workshops, and virtual booth, you may use the links located at the top of your screen or simply click on the Return to Main Page button and select the desired option. Should you encounter any issues, you may reach out to our help desk team by clicking on the button in the upper right corner of your screen. Please note that we will have a Q&A session with the CRA representatives from 1 to 1.30 p.m. However, you may also visit the virtual booth area where you will have a chance to directly interact with our presenters. I would like to remind you that today's presentation will be sent to you via email. Finally, we ask you to kindly complete the survey and provide us with your feedback so that we may tailor our content for next year's conference. 
Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our first presenters, Mr. Stuart Fletcher, Senior Program Officer in the Digital Services Communications Section at the Digital Services Directorate of the Canada Revenue Agency, and Mr. Brent Renault, Team Leader of the T2 System Development Team at the Canada Revenue Agency, who will tell us about the recent changes to the CRA Digital Services and the T2 program, as well as a look forward on the changes to come. Without further ado, here are Stuart and Brent with the CRA updates for 2023. Take it away, Stuart. Hello, my name is Stuart Fletcher. Uh, I work in the Digital Services Communications section of the CRA. Uh, today's presentation is on the updates made to the CRA's digital services over the past year, uh, as well as a glimpse of some upcoming changes. I would like to first mention that any future release dates listed in this presentation are tentative and subject to change. Uh, taxpayer self-services in my account. Uh, in February of 2023, a new unallocated payment section was added on the accounts and payments page in my account. A transfer a credit button is available to transfer unallocated payments to a tax balance owing uh, or a current year installment and all in real time. Uh, this update reduces the need for taxpayers to call the CRA. Uh, mail updates in my account. So the CRA is aiming to deliver consistent digital communication services across secure portals and provide a secure repository for two-way correspondence and for user activity. In October of 2023, the following changes were made to the mail page in my account. The, the service was updated with an enhanced user interface. This includes uh, users having the ability to view letters and uh, content on the same screen. Uh, the service has a new and improved message mailing filtering and sorting system, and users will be able to access all unread correspondence on the main mail page. A new feature within the service is offered to users for programs that have the ability to reply to users. An example of this would be the audit inquiries uh, service in my account, and they will be the first pilot uh, of this new feature. Uh, an interactive access service button was added to direct users to different communication services that are available within the My Account portal. Changes to the mail and other communication services will be launched across all of our portals at different times. So we have this first um, uh, update going, that went in in October of 2023. Uh, My Trust account will have similar features uh, updated in February of 2024. My business account will have uh, updates in spring of 2024, uh, more specifically, probably May of 2024, and represent a client is still to be determined. Connect with us in my account. Uh, a new link called Connect with us was added to the correspondence sidebar in the My Account uh, service. This will take users to a page with options to contact the CRA or to get help on specific topics which can be found outside of the portal. Uh, links on this page include help with my account, about my account, cancel authorizations for representatives, CRA user ID and password help and FAQ, contact the Canada Revenue Agency, audit inquiries, file a formal dispute and request relief of penalties and interest as well as some other additional uh, contact links. A new look and feel in My Business Account. So in October of 2023, um, the My Business Account overview pages were given a new look and feel. Uh, the new My Business Account look and feel will showcase a modern user-friendly and consistent user, user interface. And these will mirror the recent changes made uh, into My Account. Uh, balance not yet due in my business account, uh, another October 2023 update. On the view and pay account balance page in my business account, a new proceed to pay button was added to the outstanding balance section to make a payment for an amount related to a period that has been assessed but is not yet due. From a client's perspective, the balance not yet due is still seen as the current amount owing 
and clients want the ability to pay their assessed return balance that is not yet uh, effective. Progress Tracker. The Progress Tracker service provides individuals, businesses, and their representatives with status updates on their files and inquiries submitted to the CRA, as well as target completion dates. In January of 2023, the following file types were added to the Progress Tracker found in My Business Account. Appeals, Business Formal Disputes. Appeals, Business Taxpayer Relief of Penalties and Interest. T2 Initial Assessments and T2 Adjustments. Applications for registration as a charity or registered Canadian Amateur Athletic Association, as well as registered charity information returns, have been available since May of 2022. Progress Tracker is also available in My Account. For a full list of My Account files that can be tracked, the Canadian uh, Child Tax Benefit applications, this was new in May of 2023, T1 tax returns, T1 tax adjustment requests, disability tax credit applications, requests for relief of penalties and interests, and objections. In addition to what you can currently find on Progress Tracker, beginning in January of 2024, My Business Account users will also be able to track the progress of GST returns and uh, GST reassessments. Luxury tax updates in My Business Account. The View Transaction Details link has been added to the My Business Account overview page for the Luxury Tax Program in the Balance and Payments section of the screen. This gives luxury tax filers the ability to view their assessment online. The B501 Luxury Tax and Information Return for Non-Registrants web form is now available in My Business Account. When selecting the file, a return option, uh, luxury tax non-registrants will be presented with the new web form and will no longer need to upload their saved PDF file. Underused housing updates in My Business Account. Um, the Government of Canada implemented effective as of January 1st, 2022, a national annual 1% tax on the value of non-resident, non-Canadian owned residential real estate that is considered to be vacant or underused. In my business account, a new underused housing tax program account was added in February of 2023 with options to file a return, to view the status and details, to view direct deposit transactions, and to, uh, to the inquiry service that's available in my business account. In October of 2023, a new link for the request relief of penalties and interests form uh, the ERC 4288 uh, was added to my business account. Uh, my business account, or sorry, uh, the my account also has uh, services for underused housing tax, and this is added under the tax return section. And this was added in February of 2023. The options available to users there are to file a UHT or underused housing tax return, amend a return and to review the status and details of returns. Uh, first home savings account. The Government of Canada, as part of Budget 2022, proposed to create the Tax-Free First Home Savings Account, or FHSA, a new registered account to help individuals save for the purchasing of their first home. The FHSA will allow Canadians to save up to $8,000 each year with a lifetime maximum contribution of $40,000. The FHSA is expected to be implemented in both my account and my business account in February of 2024. In my business account, the current TFSA BN program account uh, identifier RZ uh, will have its name changed to savings account group and will include both TFSA and FHSA. The FHSA will provide individuals in my account and their representatives from my uh, represent a client, the electronic channel to view FHSA account information, such as transaction details and summaries, deduction limits, uh, accepted and rejected information records of financial institutions, returns based on CRA assessed and reassessed results, deduction limit statements, um, and have annual and cumulative uh, FHSA allowable deduction amounts and taxable income on FHSA withdrawals displayed to them. My trust account. 
So the CRA has implemented an initial suite of services in my trust account to provide legal and authorized representatives of trust accounts with a secure and convenient way to view and manage trust information online. Uh, my trust account is ac accessed through uh, represent a client. At launch, the services available for legal and authorized representatives of trust accounts is limited. Uh, updates in February uh, included, uh, this was February of 2023, included view trust related tax information, correspondence online, and provide payment options as well as a few other services. Further developments to the portal are expected for February of 2024 to make this more of a full service digital platform similar to my business account or my account. Common user services. The CRA is looking to improve the user experience by creating consistency with services that exist in multiple portals. In the coming months, some of our services will be given a new design to create a common look and feel across all of the portals. So the most recent, uh, in October, we had updates to the audit inquiry service in my account. Um, in November of this year, uh, the special elections and return services in my business account uh, will be given this common look and feel. But those services that you find in my business account for special election and returns will also be added to my account, which is new uh, uh, to users so they can sign into either portal. The authorized representative service in my account and my trust account will be given this common look and feel. And in February of 2024, we are expecting to be able to update the submit document service in my business account with this common look and feel. Authorization request signature page uh, has been removed in represent a client. So as of May of 2023, when a representative submits an authorization request to represent a business client in represent a client, uh, the authorization signature page will no longer be generated as the authorization process will be finalized within my business account by the actual business client. Uh, if the business does not have access to use any of the digital uh, CRA's digital services, there are exclusions. Uh, however, um, in most cases, they will need to sign in and use the authorize my rep service within bus my business account. Client names on printouts in represent a client. As of October 2023, when a representative accesses a client's My Account and uses the print button, the client's name will now appear on the printed page. Uh, this was implemented from direct feedback that we received from representatives. Non-resident callback requests. Non-residents and their representatives are now able to fill out a new web form on Canada.ca to request a callback from a non-resident CRA specialist for questions related to their registration, their account, GST security, and more. Uh, Non-resident clients often have to wait in long phone queues to speak with an agent. Representatives and clients say they, they'd prefer to fill out a form, uh, which includes the reason for the request and for a callback from a CRA agent. Maddie, change to alberta.ca account. So in February of 2022, we partnered with the province of Alberta to add a new My Account sign-in option for Canadians who hold a My Alberta digital ID, which is the digital identity issued by the province of Alberta. In June of 2023, the Alberta government replaced the My Alberta digital ID brand, previously known as Maddie, with the new branding of Alberta.ca account. Minimizing lockouts. So the CRA introduced updates to help reduce users from getting locked out of their accounts. So first we have a reveal password. Um, when signing into the CRA's sign-in services, users are now able to click a new eye icon to reveal their password. Uh, and as well as the multi-factor authentication updates. So when enrolling in multi-factor authentication, users are able to self-correct their information rather than be locked out. When entering the multi-factor authentication one-time passcode, a format error will now be shared when a user enters less than the six digits. This advises the user of the correct format and helps them prevent uh, a lockout. 
Enhanced Security In October of 2023, we've introduced updates to enhance the security of the CRA sign-in services. The first update is reducing the maximum number of active credentials. The CRA has determined that reducing the amount of allowable credentials will further enhance the security of the CRA sign-in services. As of October 2023, new users are only able to register for one credential, which is a CRA user ID and password, or sign-in partner. In addition to this one credential, they are able to enroll with a provincial partner such as BC Services or Alberta.ca for my account only. Um, existing users uh, can continue to use their existing credentials and are not impacted by this change. Existing credentials will only be removed if users call in and an agent needs to access the authentication credential inquiry system or if the user revokes it themselves. Additionally, revocation of dormant CRA and sign-in partner credentials occurs on a quarterly and ad hoc basis, which will slowly reduce the number of users with more than one credential. Second update is new authentication requirements for registration. To further enhance the security of CRA sign-in services, the agency will be adding an additional authentication component further to the existing shared secrets that taxpayers must enter to validate their identity during registration, which is like the, uh, the social insurance number, date of birth, postal code or zip code, and an amount entered from one of their income tax and benefit returns, they will now be asked to provide their gross income, line 15,000, uh, that has been calculated and reported on their most recent return. The last update for security is mailed CRA security code expiration. Mailed CRA security codes will now expire after four months rather than the previous 16 months and will expire upon successful use. Identity Validation Service. The agency is committed to providing Canadians with access to more digital services to help taxpayers more easily access some innovation, science and economic development services and programs. They will now have the option to be validated through the CRA's sign in services. The ICED webpage will be directed to a new chooser page that will allow them to validate their identity with a CRA credential or sign-in partner credential. Once a taxpayer's identity has been validated through the CRA sign-in services, they will have the ability to access ICED services and or programs. Users will not have the ability to register a credential through this chooser page and must either uh, have an existing credential or register through an alternative service such as my account, my business account, or represent a client. CRA single sign-in. The CRA is developing a means where a user will only be required to sign in once to access their my account, my business account, represent a client, my trust account, and the upcoming non-resident account. A user would simply sign in and then access any of the accounts available to them. We are looking to create a new sign-in page with a new name. Non-resident tax account online portal. Preliminary work is being done to create a non-resident portal. The name will tentatively be my non-resident account. This new account will be one of the options available as part of the single sign-in project. Optional email notifications in My Business Account. We are working to introduce optional email notifications for businesses. Some email notifications will be mandatory to ensure securities of accounts, such as address updates or direct deposit information, but businesses will be able to choose to receive additional optional notifications. Optional notifications may include GST reminder to file, payment notifications, GST compliance hold and refunds, and progress tracker for T2. Interact Document Verification Service. The CRA is working to implement an Interact Document Verification Service as an alternative option to the current CRA security code. Currently, taxpayers must enter their CRA security code to gain full access to their personal and business information online. The Interact solution will provide taxpayers with a secure method to validate their identity in real time, allowing full and immediate access to their personal and business information. Taxpayers will not need to wait the five to 10 business days for a security code in the mail. Currently, this is to be determined as far as a release date. This concludes the updates of the CRA's uh, digital services for this year, and we thank you for your participation. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Brent Renault. I am the team leader of the T2 development team in the Canada Revenue Agency's Business Returns Directorate. Today, I will discuss some of the T2 program updates my team has implemented, as well as some proposed legislative measures that we are currently working on implementing. Beginning in 2024, the $1 million gross revenue threshold related to mandatory electronic filing, MEF, for T2 corporation income tax returns will be lifted. Thus, most corporations will be required to file their T2 returns electronically in order to avoid an MEF penalty, with the following exceptions. An insurance corporation, a non-resident corporation, a corporation reporting in functional currency, a corporation exempt from tax under Section 149 of the Income Tax Act. Corporations that are required to file electronically but do not do so will be subject to a mandatory electronic filing penalty equal to $1,000. On January 1st, 2023, new international accounting rules for insurance contracts, known as International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS 17, came into effect. IFRS 17 aims to improve the financial reporting of insurance contracts by mandating a consistent framework across countries, industries, and types of insurance contracts. It also aims to provide more transparent and useful information about the value of insurance obligations and the profitability of insurance contracts. Due to the changes brought about by the IFRS 17 reporting standards, major changes were made to T2 schedules 35, 38, and 150, along with the introduction of a new T2 Schedule 151. As of October 2023, the CRA will now accept electronically filed T2 Schedules 150 and 151. The Province of Ontario has introduced the Ontario-made Manufacturing Investment Tax Credit for Corporations. This new 10% refundable corporate income tax credit is for capital investments in buildings, machinery, and equipment used in manufacturing or processing. The credit will be available to Canadian-controlled private corporations that make qualifying investments and that have a permanent establishment in Ontario. Qualifying investments will be expenditures for certain capital property included in Class 1 or Class 53 for capital cost allowance purposes. Qualifying investments in Class 1 will include expenditures for constructing, renovating, or acquiring buildings used for manufacturing or processing in Ontario that become available for use on or after March 23, 2023. Qualifying investments in Class 53 will include expenditures for machinery and equipment used in the manufacturing or processing of goods in Ontario, acquired and available for use on or after March 23, 2023 and before 2026. After 2025, qualifying investments will include expenditures for machinery and equipment used in the manufacturing or processing of goods for sale or lease that are included in Class 43A. The credit will be available for qualifying investments up to a limit of $20 million in a tax year and will be prorated for a short tax year. An associated group of corporations will be subject to the $20 million limit. The Department of Finance has released a number of draft legislative proposals, some of which will impact corporations. As of the date of this recording, legislation for these proposed measures has not yet been introduced in the House of Commons. These proposed measures include Investment Tax Credit for Carbon Capture, Utilization and Storage, CCUS. Per the proposed legislation, the CCUS ITC will be refundable and available to businesses that incur qualified CCUS expenditures after 2021 and before 2041. Qualified CCUS expenditures will include the cost of acquiring eligible equipment used in qualified CCUS projects. Eligible equipment will include equipment that is situated in Canada and used solely to capture, transport, store, or use carbon dioxide, CO2, as part of a qualified CCUS project. This equipment will be included in new capital cost allowance, CCA, 
classes 57 and 58. For qualified CCUS expenditures incurred after 2021 and before 2031, credit rates are 60% for qualified carbon capture expenditures used to capture carbon directly from ambient air, 50% for other qualified carbon capture expenditures, and 37.5% for qualified carbon transportation storage or use expenditures. These credit rates are reduced by half for eligible expenses incurred after 2030 and before 2041. Clean Technology Investment Tax Credit. As proposed, a 30% refundable tax credit available in respect of the capital costs of clean energy generation systems, i.e. solar, wind, hydro, nuclear, electricity storage systems, low carbon heat and electricity equipment, industrial zero emission vehicles, and certain geothermal equipment that is used primarily to produce geothermal energy or heat energy or both solely from geothermal sources. Labor requirements related to certain investment tax credits. The labor conditions generally require that workers engaged in project elements subsidized by an applicable ITC must satisfy a prevailing wage requirement and an apprenticeship requirement. These conditions generally require that for applicable workers, wages meet or exceed what is determined to be a prevailing wage by reference to applicable collective agreements, and that a minimum level 10% of labor hours are performed by registered apprentices. For specified property prepared or installed after September 30th, 2023, corporations that do not meet the required labor requirements as applicable to specific ITCs will be subject to a 10% reduction of the tax credit. Tax on repurchase of equity. As per the proposed legislation, there will be a 2% share buyback tax applied to the net value of an issuer's repurchases of equity. This will affect Canadian resident public corporations that have shares listed on a designated stock exchange other than mutual fund corporations. Thank you, Stuart and Brent, for these updates from the Canada Revenue Agency. We would like to remind you that a Q&A session with the CRA representatives will be held from 1 to 1.30 p.m. to answer any questions you may have on today's topics. Please note, however, that questions must be limited to the topics covered during the presentation. The CRA representatives attending the Q&A session will not be able to respond to other topics that are outside of their expertise. All other questions should be directed to the designated CRA representatives who can be reached at these toll-free numbers listed at the bottom of your screen. Now, on to the updates and tax changes that Revenu Québec has in store for us for 2023. To tell us about them, we welcome Mr. Eric Godin, Business Architect for the Electronic Service Delivery Products Department at Revenu Québec. Eric will also tell us about the unlocking of net file codes in the My Account for Professional Representatives portal, the Trust Registration Service in both the My Account for Professional Representatives and the My Account for Businesses portals, and the document exchange services deployed as part of the CSEV project following last year's presentation. Eric, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is uh, Eric. Uh, obviously, I work at Revenu Quebec, um, and today I will uh, uh, tell you about some recent changes that we've made that might interest you. So if we look at the uh, contents for today, we have unlocking NetFile Quebec transmission codes, we have registration of trusts, and we have document sharing. Um, so if we look at the uh, at unlocking NetFile Quebec transmission codes, just a bit of background, you probably already know about this, but uh, you need a NetFile Quebec transmission code to send uh, income tax returns. Uh, with this code, you can also download uh, tax information of clients. And uh, the thing with this code is uh, when it was locked 
until very recently. Uh, for example, if you uh, entered the wrong passcode for multiple times or something like that, it got locked. Uh, you absolutely had to contact Revenu Quebec to unlock the code. So what we did is in my account for professional representatives, uh, you can go and uh, uh, there's a new function that's called uh, unlock, simply called unlock. Um, and when you click on unlock, what it does is it actually does uh, what we did uh, when you used to call to unlock a, a code. So it just unlocks it. And it takes just a few minutes, and then the original code uh, can be reused as before. Uh, when the function unlock appears, the function regenerate uh, disappears. But uh, as soon as it's unlocked, you can use the regenerate function again. Uh, just a quick note, you've probably noticed that the image in this page is in French. All images is in, are in French in the presentation. Uh, it's a rule at Revenu Quebec. I don't know if everyone has this rule or not, but we can put the, we can speak in English and put text in English, but the images have to be in French. Um, but I guess uh, I'm hoping the information that we've uh, written uh, in this presentation is enough uh, for you. Um, and that's it. That's uh, it's not. Uh, it's a very simple uh, function, but uh, we hope that it's going to be useful. Um, so if we go uh, to registration of trusts, uh, again, a little bit of background. Um, there's a recent change uh, a few years back already, a couple of years back. Uh, change made made to tax registration concerning trust identification. I'm practicing my English at the same time. Uh, sorry about that. Um, a trust identification number, sorry, must now be entered on all returns, reports, and other documents that trust files with Revenue Quebec under tax law. Uh, and Revenue Quebec is obviously taking steps to help trust get an identification number. Um, so if you look first, in my account for businesses, what we did is there's a new uh, function in there in other services uh, and you can apply for a, a registration number for trust. So to access the service, basically, uh, obviously the business must be registered for my account for businesses. And the person using the service must be responsible for the business businesses, business online services, and have full access rights or hold the power of attorney allowing them to act on the business's behalf. The business must be the main trustee or liquidator of the succession. Um, and uh, it's uh, pretty simple to use. And once you do use it, uh, what happens is there's a letter confirming the trust uh, registration. Uh, it's sent to the mailing address of the business, and uh, it, the letter is also available in the inbox for in my account for businesses. And here's, uh, uh, oh, sorry, the, we have an example of the letter, but it's later on in the presentation. But the same, t uh, there's another function. The same function is also available in my account for professional representative, uh, which you can see on the screen. Obviously, the professional representative has to have uh, authorization to use uh, this uh, function for one of his clients. And uh, so if you look at the uh, requirements, basically, uh, uh, obviously, he has to be registered to my account for professional representative. Uh, they must be a coordinator, division head, or a user with the necessary access privileges. And they must have a completed form copy of form MR69V. Um, and again, a letter is sent to the trust's registration uh, to its mailing address. And the letter can be viewed in the client's in inbox in my account for personal representative. And here is a copy of a letter, which I just mentioned. Uh, it's pretty simple, straightforward. 
Uh, but again, uh, it's in French, but I guess uh, I hope you, you get the point. Uh, uh, thirdly and last, uh, document sharing. Uh, if uh, you saw my presentation from last year, uh, it's the same thing. It's, this is basically a reminder of uh, what we're offering now so that uh, we can share documents in my account. So um, it concerns uh, the three main my accounts. So my account for individuals, for businesses, and for professional representative. Uh, basically, uh, we can send documents in my account, so documents from us can be received. And uh, you can send documents to Revenue Quebec. Uh, you can send documents that we requested or documents that we have not requested. We'll be able to see that later on in the presentation in just a few short minutes. So how it works, uh, it's again, very, very simple. Uh, if Revenue Quebec want to send you documents, uh, basically, we deposit uh, the document in my account. You, uh, well, the client receives a notice in their personal email that they have a new message in my account. And when uh, the client opens uh, the message in my account, the documents are attached uh, to the message. So it's pretty, pretty simple. So basically, this is the inbox in my account. Uh, it works this I just have one image but it works the same way in my account for individual businesses professional representative so as you can see here you received a new message in the Xbox in the inbox <laughs> sorry about that again uh, and uh, oh, I'm sorry I don't have an example of the uh, actual letter with the uh, the documents attached but basically you open um, the message here and uh, the documents will be able to download and do whatever you want with them. Um, document sharing also enables Revenue Quebec to uh, request documents. So basically, we can send you a request for documents. Uh, example for an audit or uh, anything, can be anything really. But uh, the way it works, again, fairly simple. Uh, Revenue Quebec sends a, no a request for documents. Uh, the client again receives a notice in their personal email that they have a request for documents in my account. Logs into my account. Uh, the request is uh, you can be viewed in the inbox. You, you have a new uh, uh, you have a new message in the Xbox in the inbox. I I keep saying Xbox. I'm sorry. I don't know what happens there. But uh, you have a new message in the I inbox, and um, there's a link uh, that uh, there's a link to the uh, request for documents. You can see which documents we've requested, and you can send the documents, basically. Uh, so here's. Uh, an example of the inbox with the new message. And here's all uh, at the page where you can see all the requests for documents that have been received from Revenu Quebec. And you just uh, click on the uh, request that you uh, want to uh, send documents. And then um, it, it's fairly simple. Uh, there's no detailed images in the presentation because as I've said earlier, we've gone all through this last year so this is basically a reminder so it's pretty uh, but just a reminder uh, you can receive requests for documents in my account so if you speak with someone from Revenu Quebec don't hesitate to ask them to use this function to uh, exchange documents whether it's documents you want to receive from Revenu Quebec or send to Revenu Quebec don't hesitate to ask it's a fairly new function so um, uh, more and more people are using it and have heard about it. Uh, don't hesitate to ask to use it. It's uh, pretty fun. We like it a lot. So, Anyway, uh, <laughs> lastly, um, this last thing in my presentation, um, 
this has just been uh, uh, made available in uh, my account for businesses and professional representatives and uh, individuals. Um, clients can use my account to send documents that have not been requested. So, for example, documents that today you have no other choice but to send uh, by mail, for example, uh, you can use this instead. And how it works, again, fairly simple, I think. Uh, the client logins to my account, uses the service to send the document, and uh, Rukno Quebec receives the document, and then we send a message to uh, the person who sent us the documents to tell them what we are going to do with the document. So those are real example on the screen, at, on your screen, of uh, documents that uh, can be sent using this function. So voluntary disclosure, uh, some document related to a charity's request to change the period of fisc fiscal period many more so i recommend you just go see on there what you can send to revenue quebec and um it's ac you can access this function through the inbox in uh, my account so as you can see there's a link here and when you click on the click on the link you can choose a subject for which you want to send us some documents and then there's a list of documents that we uh, uh, accept using this function and uh, you just uh, upload your documents and that's pretty much it you click so uh, you click on uh, next and then you uh, that's pretty much it you, <laughs> you receive a confirmation number so um, and what happens afterwards it's not written in the presentation but uh, when we do receive the document we uh, analyze it and we send the person who sent us the document we send them a message in their ex inbox in my account uh, to tell them either we accept the document or we gonna if for some reason uh, we don't know what it is or it's not for us we can refuse it but uh, yeah we send uh, a message to tell uh, the sender what we're going to do and that's pretty much it so um, uh, thank you very much uh, thank you for letting me practice my English I hope that was clear enough for y'all for everyone and uh, have a nice day thank you thank you Eric for this excellent presentation ladies and gentlemen we will now take a 10 minute break to allow you to stretch a little bit. We would like to remind you that our speakers will be on hand to answer your questions in the virtual booth section. Thank you.
Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, Jerry Vitoratos. Jerry has been working with Thomson Reuters for over 11 years as a trainer and tax support resource person. He has been providing training sessions to tax professionals all over Canada. He also made several radio and TV appearances on BNN and Global TV as the UFILE tax specialist. Jerry obtained both his graduate diploma in taxation in 2018 and his master's degree in taxation in 2020 from the Université de Sherbrooke. I would like to invite Jerry to present to us the 2023 tax update. Jerry, the floor is all yours. Hello, and welcome to the tax update session of Synergy 2023. My name is Jerry Vitoratos, head trainer at DT Tax and Accounting. And today, what we're going to look at in this session will be the new measures when it comes to personal tax return, new measures on the corporate side, and new measures on the trust side as well. What's going to be unique about the session is that we're not just going to do a tax update for 2023, but also give you a preview of some of the changes that are coming in 2024. So let's get started. So we're going to start with the personal tax changes and the personal tax measures in this case. What is coming up? So like I mentioned in the introduction, we're going to look at 2023, but also 2024. So in the slides, when you don't see a reference to a year, the changes will be for 2023, while if the changes relate to 2024, it'll be mentioned on the slide. So the first change that we've got here is the grocery tax rebate, which is simply a supplemental amount to the quarterly GST credit. So, so essentially what this, what this amount is, is a doubling of the existing GST tax credit for the January 2023 payment. That's what it is. So you see the examples here of the maximum amount that they can receive on top of the GST credit, which is $153 per adult, $81 per child, and $81 for the single supplement. And as I just mentioned as well, the rebate applies to the GST payment that was paid in January 2023. So now we're going to talk about the tax-free first home savings account or FHSA, which is a tax change coming for 2023. I did give a preview of it last year and give quite a detailed preview of it as well. But now we're going to start seeing it in the market. Your clients are going to start bringing now the slips. We're going to see what the slip is. They're going to start bringing those slips now for the contributions that they're making. So it's a good thing to really go through a review to see what the rules are. How does this uh, FHSA work? And on the administrative side, how is it going to be applied on the tax turn? Because we finally now have some information on the administrative side and the slip that your client's going to get and the schedule, which is a new schedule that will be produced on the tax return. So first, what is the FHSA? The FHSA, very simply put, is a new registered account that will allow individuals to save money in a tax sheltered account for the purposes of a down payment when they purchase what the government deems as their first home. And we're going to see in a minute, what the government means by the purchase of a first home. So just like an RRSP, the contributions that your clients will make to the FHSA are tax deductible, same way as the RRSP. However, on the other side, the withdrawals will also be tax-free like a TFSA as long as the withdrawal is what the government deems as a qualifying withdrawal, meaning that it has been withdrawn for the purposes of the purchase of a first home. And the account has now been available since 2023. It took a while for financial institutions to really get up and running. But I believe since April or May of 2023, the first uh, financial institutions started offering uh, these accounts, uh, contributions to these accounts. Uh, and now it's basically widespread. Now, what is a qualifying individual? So who is eligible to create the FHSA? Well, first of all, it has to be a resident of Canada. Number two, they have to be at least 18 years old and above, and they must be considered what the government 
deems as a first-time home buyer, which means that neither they nor their spouse owned the home in which they lived in in the last four calendar years. So notice here, we have the same contamination rule that we see with the home buyer's plan, meaning that if one of the two spouses is not eligible to create the FHSA, then neither is eligible for the FHSA. So we get the contributions and we get to the annual and lifetime limits. So the annual, the annual limit is set at $8,000 per year and the lifetime limit is set at $40,000 per year. Now be mindful of the fact that these limits only start accumulating once you create the account. Unlike a TFSA, for example, where the moment you turned 18, you start ha accumulating a TFSA limit, whether you create an account or not, the FHSA, the limits only accumulate the moment you create the account. Now, as I mentioned before, any contributions you make to the FHSA are tax deductible at the same level as an RRSP. And just like an RRSP, you are not required to use your full contribution as a deduction on your current year tax return. You can carry forward any uh, portion that you have not used to a future year. Also, you're not required to make the full annual limit contribution, meaning that, for example, if you only contribute a lesser amount uh, in the current year, then the excess amount will, uh, will be carried forward, the excess amount of limit will be carried forward to the following year and added to the following year's limit. Now, what are qualified investments when it comes to an FHSA? Well, qualified investment is the same as a TFSA meaning that they, any, uh, an individual can buy investments such as mutual funds, publicly traded securities, government and corporate bonds, and guaranteed investment certificates. So anything that can be bought in a TFSA can also be bought in an FHSA. Now, what are the qualifying withdrawals? I mentioned before that the contributions are tax deductible and the withdrawals are tax free as long as the funds are used as a down payment for the purchase of a first home. And that's, that's what constitutes a qualifying withdrawal. As long as the withdrawal is made in order to put a down payment on the purchase of a first home, remember again the definition of a first home, which is that the individual could not have lived in a, in a property that they owned in, in the last four calendar years. As long as they meet that criteria, then it is, con it is considered a qualifying withdrawal. Now, do they have to put the funds right away when they, when they withdraw uh, the money from the FHSA? No. The taxpayer must have a written agreement to buy or build a qualifying home before October 1st of the year following the year of withdrawal. So there is a grace period there. If a withdrawal is made... For again, a withdrawal is made and the, and the funds are not used right away for a down payment, then you have till October 1st of the following year in order to make that down payment and purchase that first home. Beyond that point, then the, if, if, if beyond October 1st, there is no purchase of a first home, then the qualifying withdrawal is no longer a qualifying withdrawal and it becomes a taxable withdrawal. So in any other scenario, where there's a withdrawal from an FHSA and it doesn't meet the two criteria that we see here for qualifying withdrawals, the, the withdrawal is then considered a non-qualifying withdrawal, which means it is taxable. So it'll be income added to the tax return and taxes will be withheld at source. Now, what is a qualifying home? A qualifying home is simply a housing unit that is located in Canada and it can include as well cooperative housing in this case within Canada. Transfers. So what happens now if there are transfers between these registered accounts? For example, uh, transfers between an FHSA account to an RSP account and vice versa. Are there any tax consequences and can we make transfers between these accounts? The answer is yes, you can make transfers between these accounts. Now, what are the tax consequences to those transfers? Well, any transfer that is done from an FHSA account to an RSP account would be non-taxable. So there would be, it would be, they would be done on a tax free basis. On top of it, there's a bonus in this case. On top of it, the transfer between an FHSA account and an RSP account does not affect the RSP contribution limit. 
that's an interesting tidbit when it comes to these transfers. And we're going to see later on that there's some tax planning that can be done between these two accounts, especially when it comes to these transfers. Now, the catch is, though, the moment the transfer happens from an FHSA to an RSP account, that transfer does not reinstate the limit that was used up originally when those contributions were made to the FHSA account. That's the catch. However, when the transfer happens, it does not affect the RSP contribution limit. That's an interesting tidbit. We're going to come back to it in a minute. Now, what happens in the other, the other way? What happens if I'm transferring amounts from an RSP to an FHSA account? Same effect when it comes to the tax return. It, it is done on a tax-free basis. However, in that scenario, it does affect the FHSA contribution limit. Meaning that if you're transferring an amount from an RSP to an FHSA, you are using the annual and lifetime limit of the FHSA account. So it's not unlimited here. You have to be really careful when you're making these kind of transfers between the RSP and FHSA. So some interesting tax planning scenarios emerge out of these rules that we see when it comes to transfers. Let's take the first scenario here of a transfer from an FHSA to an RSP. As we mentioned before, this transfer does not affect the contribution room in, in the RSP account. So in that scenario, this kind of transfer represents a de facto extension of the RSP contribution limit. Let me explain. Let's say you have an individual here who maxes out their RSP contributions every single year, and they are also eligible as a first-time home buyer, which means that they are eligible now to create their FHSA account. Now, let's assume these are renters, of course, right? Because they're, or they're living with their parents, let's say. It's, a, it's somebody who's, uh, uh, who's in their 20s living with their parents, okay? And they're not necessarily planning on buying a home. Does an FHSA account become interesting for those individuals if, let's say, they're not really planning on buying a home? The answer is yes, especially those who are maximizing their RSP contribution limit every single year, okay? The reason being that they could always transfer the amounts from an FHSA to their RSP account. And what they get out of it, out of creating that FHSA account, is an extra $8,000 of annual contribution limit, which they don't have with their RSP account. Remember, I could transfer these amounts between the accounts. So I can maximize my RSP account, create my FHSA account, and fund that FHSA account as well with the additional FHSA annual contribution limit. And even if I'm not planning on buying a home, we'll see in a minute that I could, again, just transfer the amounts from the FHSA back into my RSP account. So in that scenario, again, the FHSA represents an extension of my RSP contribution limit. Now let's take the other way. Let's take the scenario of contributions or sorry, amounts from an RSP transferred to an FHSA. You might say to yourself, well, why even do that? I, you know, we do have the home buyer's plan that we can use under the RSP to put a down payment on a first home. But there are two disadvantages to the home buyer's plan withdrawal. Number one, you are capped at a, at a fixed amount at a ceiling, which is $35,000. While with the FHSA, there's no ceiling. Whatever ends up being the final amount of the account is what you can actually withdraw and the sky's the limit. If the market goes well, if you uh, invest properly in the FHSA, your withdrawal can be a substantive amount and it is not capped at all. While with the home buyer's plan, your withdrawal will be capped at $35,000. Secondly, secondly, you have to repay the amount of the withdrawal back into your RSP account. Remember that a, a home buyer's plan is effectively a loan. It's not money that you could simply withdraw on a tax-free basis and never repay. You have to repay your account starting in the second year after with the withdrawal year and within 15 installments over the next 15 years. But in FHSA, when I make the withdrawal, I don't have to repay that account. I make the withdrawal on a tax-free basis. I could, I could use it as, uh, as a down payment for the purchase of my first home, and I never have to repay my FHSA account. This is where a transfer between an RSP and an FHSA becomes really interesting. So let's say you have somebody who is planning on buying a home within the next year or two, and they have quite a few funds in their, 
uh, in their RRSP account. Well, now what they can do is that they can slowly start transferring amounts from their RSP into their FHSA, and then the year that they're ready to purchase the home and they make the purchase, now they've got a tax-free withdrawal instead of a loan, which would have been the home buyer's plan. So you see those interesting scenarios that these transfer rules present to us. Now, continuing with the transfers, when does the FHSA expire? Is there an expiry date, first of all, within the FHSA? The answer is yes. Okay, it is, not an, it is not an eternal account. It is not an account that continues on until death. Okay, unlike uh, what we have with, for example, a TFSA, for example, or an RSP that converts into a RIF, but the RIF continues on until the person is deceased or the funds run out. But in FHSA, there is a time limit. And the time limit is essentially 15 years after the creation of the account. It is the first of the three dates that you see here. So it is either the 15th anniversary of the year of, uh, of the initial opening of the account, the individual turns 71, or the individual makes their qualifying withdrawal. The, the, the soonest of these three dates will become, in this case, the end of the account, and the account expires as of that point. Now, if there's any unused funds within the account, within the FHSA account, by the time one of these things happens, then a transfer can be done back to an RSP account. And remember, that transfer is done without using the RSP contribution limit. So if we go back to my example, my tax planning example that we had before, take the individual who maxes out their RSP limit and then creates their FHSA account. If at the end of the day, after 15 years, they never purchase a home, there's no consequence in this case. They simply tr transfer the, at the 15th anniversary, they close their FHSA account, and they transfer the funds back into their RSP account. This is why I was mentioning that if you play the cards right here, tax planning wise, your FHSA account becomes a de facto extension of your RSP account and a de facto extension of the RSP contribution limit. So what's the interaction between the FHSA and income tested benefits like, uh, like for example, the GST credit or the Canada child benefit? Well, it's the same effect on the contribution side is the same effect as an RSP contribution. So as, as mentioned before, every contribution you make to the FHSA is tax deductible, which means it'll reduce your net income, which should increase your benefits in this case. Now, a qualifying withdrawal, as mentioned before, is tax-free, meaning there is no extra income to declare when there is a qualifying withdrawal. So it would not affect, in this case, the income-tested benefits, such as the Canada Child Benefit and the GST. Interaction with the home buyer's plan. Is there a conflict between the FHSA and the home buyer's plan? For example, does the individual have to choose between an FHSA withdrawal or a home buyer's plan withdrawal? The answer is no. They can choose to do both. There is no conflict between the two accounts. So withdrawals from both can be done as long, of course, as you meet the criteria of being a first time home buyer. Spousal contributions and attribution rules. So we cannot make any spousal contributions when it comes to the FHSA, unlike an RSP account where uh, one individual can make contributions into their spouse's uh, RSP uh, account uh, using their own RSP contribution limit. However, what's interesting with the FHSA is that there are no attribution rules, meaning that, very simply put, one spouse can give funds to the other in order for that spouse to fund their own FHSA account. Deceased individuals, what happens in the case of a deceased account holder? Well, if the beneficiary is the spouse, then the spouse becomes the new holder of the FHSA and simply can continue the FHSA account. However, if the spouse is not eligible as a first-time home buyer as of the moment of death, then the surviving spouse can transfer the amounts of their deceased spouse FHSA into their own RSP account. Now, if the beneficiary is anybody other than the spouse, then it becomes a taxable withdrawal on the year of death. Residential property flipping rule, which will be applicable starting on for any dispositions on or after January 1st, 2023. So if 
there is a real estate property that is owned for less than 12 months and it is disposed in less than 12 months after purchase, then that then the gains from that property would not be considered as capital gains, but would instead be considered as business income. And of course, we know that with capital gains, we have the 50% inclusion rate. In this case, the full gain or 100% would be considered as business income. And the way the government um, does this is by deeming the residential property as inventory in a business instead of a real estate property. Okay. So now, uh, the, uh, the rule does not apply to capital loss on a flip property. You cannot create also a business loss through an inventory loss on a flip property either. So you're not allowed in this case, even though it's business income, you would think, well, theoretically I can create a business loss if I sell it for less. Uh, in this case, it is not the, it is not the case. You cannot do it. Now there are exceptions to this rule. So we're going to look at now in a minute. Here they are. So the exceptions to the rule is, for example, death. So if the disposition was within 12 months due to a death of the owner, then uh, the, the, this new rule would not apply. A household addition. So it's a disposition due to the fact that the individual had to move in order to house an eligible relative in this case, whether it's an elderly relative or somebody who's disabled, for example. A separation. So if uh, if the property had to be disposed of in a hastily way due to a separation, again, within 12 months, remember the rule is that the property had to have been sold within 12 months from the purchase date. Uh, so that's when this rule would trigger. Okay. Now personal safety. So if this position was done due to some sort of violence, for example, domestic violence in this case, uh, then Again, it would be an exception. Disability or illness. So again, a, disposi a disposition due to a disability. They had to move, for example, to a home. They purchased the property and had to sell it within 12 months to move to something that's more amenable to that individual. Uh, employment change. So if they changed jobs uh, and they had to sell the property in order to uh, get another uh, job. But remember that the uh, travel, uh, the same uh, number of kilometers that traveled uh, that, that apply for, for the moving expense deduction would apply for the exception to the property flipping rule. Uh, uh, an involuntary termination of employment, so somebody who's laid off, they can't afford their property anymore, they sell it, and then they have to sell it within 12 months, that would be an exception as well. Insolvency, somebody who declares bankruptcy, and involuntary uh, disposition, for example, a destruction of the property, uh, a, a flood, a fire, and they had to sell the property in that case. These would be exceptions to this property flipping rule. Multi-generational home renovation tax credit. So this will be a new refundable credit on the 2023 tax return that would essentially reimburse certain uh, qualified renovation expenses incurred by either what uh, is considered a qualifying individual or a qualifying relation. And we're going to see in a minute what that means. Very simply put, what it means is a person who is housing somebody who's related to them, who is either elderly or who is, uh, or who is disabled in this case. Now the renovations have to be uh, incurred for the creation of what the government considers as a secondary dwelling unit. And we're going to see in a minute what that means as well. So who are the eligible individuals who can claim the credit? Okay, so it's a, it's a, it is an individual that is either what the government considers a qualifying individual, which we're going to see in a minute what that means, the spouse of the qualifying individual, or the qualifying relation. Either one of these individuals can claim the credit. They are the eligible individuals for this credit. So who is the qualifying individual? Essentially, it is the person who is being housed. So this is the person who is either elderly, so it's a senior that is 65 and above, or it is an adult that is eligible for the disability tax credit. Those are the qualifying individuals for the credit. Now, a qualifying relation is somebody who is related to the qualifying individual. So that can be, for example, a parent, a grandparent, child, grandchild, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, niece, and or nephew. I'm reading it directly uh, on the slide. Or the uh, spouse of the qualifying individual. Okay, so any one of these individuals can claim the credit in this case. Now, the eligible dwelling has to be a housing unit within Canada, and it must be owned either by the qualifying individual, so the person who is being housed, 
the qualifying relation, the person who is taking care of the person who's being housed, or it is both of these individuals at the same time. Okay, so that's who has to own the property. Okay, and of course, the home has to be inhabited by both of these individuals. So it's either the qualifying individual or the uh, qualifying relation. Okay, and it has to be inhabited within 12 months after the end of the renovation period. Now, the qualifying renovation, so what type of expenses are eligible in this case? Well, the renovations have to be for work that is of an enduring nature and integral to the eligible building, and it must be undertaken in order to create what the government considers as a secondary unit or a secondary dwelling. Now, what the government considers as a secondary dwelling or a secondary unit is a self-contained dwelling unit with a private kitchen, a private entrance, bathroom facilities, and a sleeping area. Now, qualifying expenses means reasonable outlays or expenses that enables the eligible person to reside in the dwelling with the qualifying relation. Okay, and the cost to those qualifying expenditures includes the cost of labor and professional services, building materials, fixtures, equipment rentals, and permits. Now, Concerning the qualifying expenditures, what these expenditures do not include, in other words, these are not qualified in this case, would be the cost of annual recurring or routine main repair and maintenance, uh, expenses to household appliances, okay, uh, cost of financing the renovations, uh, goods and services provided by a person not dealing at arm's length with a claimant, and any expenses not supported by receipts. These would not be considered as eligible expenses, renovation expenses for this credit. Now, the renovation period, because remember that the renovation period is important because they the person has to live in that property, the, the qualifying individual and the qualifying relation have to live in the property within 12 months uh, within 12 months after the end of the renovation period, right? So what does the government consider as a renovation period? It begins at the time of the application of the building permit and ends at the time that the qualifying renovation passes a final inspection. Okay, and the credit would be, would, would be available to be claimed for the tax year that includes the end of the renovation period. So if the renovations are within two calendar years, it is only the end of the renovations, the year of the end of the renovations where you can actually claim that credit. So the credit itself, and again, it is a refundable credit, I will repeat, uh, will be 15% of the lesser of the eligible expenses or $50,000. And they're only gonna, there's only going to be one allowable claim within the lifetime of the individual. So it will only be a one-time claim over the lifetime of the qualifying individual in this case. And a new schedule has been added to the tax return, which is Schedule 12. Canada Workers Benefit, the change for 2023 will be that now half of the credit will be given as a quarterly advance payment to eligible taxpayers who were eligible in the previous year. So there's no need to apply uh, for this advance payment. Uh, what the government will do essentially is look at whoever was eligible for the credit in the previous year and simply start giving them quarterly payments of half of the, of the amount that they would be entitled to for 2023 in advance. They've already started doing this. They started doing this since the month of July 2023. And they're doing it on a quarterly basis. Now, who do they choose in this case as far as who collects the payment? Let's say you have a couple uh, that is eligible in this case, their, their income is below the threshold of eligibility. Uh, then in that case, it'll be the higher income spouse that will claim the advance payment. So from here, administratively, the way the government is handling it is that, like I said, it is an automatic application. So there's nothing for your clients to do. There's nothing for you as a taxpayer to do. The, pro the government will simply uh, look at whoever was eligible in the previous year and simply give them a quarterly payment. They've been doing this since July 2023. And the way you will know that your customers have collected this advance payment will be uh, a slip, which will be the RC210, which will indicate the, the amount of advance payment received. Why is the government emitting that slip for a very simple reason it is an advance 
payment, meaning that the government is basing it on the situation of the client in the previous year. They're not basing it on what their new income will be in the current year. So there will be a reconciliation that will have to be done between the advance payment and the amount that they should collect based on the tax return, okay, based on their income for the year. And this reconciliation will be done in a new section that will be added on Schedule 6 of the tax return. Tradespeople tool expenses. This was a recent announcement by the government. Very simply put, what they're doing is that they're increasing the maximum amount for the tools deduction for tradespeople from $500 to $1,000. And this will be applied starting in 2023. Next, we got Registered Education Savings Plan, or RESP. What the government is doing here is they're increasing the withdrawal limits under the educational assistance payments. In other words, when the child finally gets into a post-secondary school and starts uh, you know, studying full-time or part-time in this case, and they start withdrawing from the RESP that was created by their parents or their grandparents or whoever it was, uh, the government is increasing the limits for uh, the withdrawals for the students. So for students that are in full-time studies, the withdrawal limit is increased from $5,000 to $8,000. And for students who are in part-time studies, the withdrawal limit increases from $2,500 to $5,000. Another change that they're making on the RESP side, uh, side is separated couples will also be able to create joint RESP accounts for their children. And these changes are in effect since the budget announcement. Like I said, this was recent. This was March 28th, 2023. Alternative minimum tax or AMT for short, we've got some fundamental changes that are coming. Basically, the government is reworking the calculation altogether, but it's only for 2024 and on. So we're not going to see this for 2023. However, the reason why I include it in this presentation is because I'm sure a lot of you have clients for which you do a lot of tax planning for, especially owners of corporations who are receiving dividends, for example. So this this change here the government is making to AMT will fundamentally change the calculations and the tax planning that you will do for these customers starting in 2024. So it's good to know what these changes are so that you can prepare for these changes uh, and, and change around the tax planning that you're doing right now with those customers. So here's a summary of the changes that the government is making. Number one, the AMT base rate is going from 15% to 20.5%. However, the government is increasing the basic exemption from 40,000 to 173,000. Now from here, a lot of the rest of the measures will be penalizing in this case for a lot of your clients. For example, the capital gains inclusion rate when computing AMT will be increased from 80% to 100%. Uh, net capital loss carry forward deduction is limited to 50%. ABLE deductions are limited to 50%. Uh, employee stock option benefits included in, a in the AMT base are increased from 50% to 100%. Most deductions for the purposes of the AMT calculation will be reduced to 50%. There's a note there I will show you. Uh, we're going to go through some of them there to see uh, what the government is limiting in this case. Most non refundable tax credits for the purposes of AMT will be limited to 50% as well. Another note there, we're going to see some of those credits. And the capital gains inclusion rate for stocks donated for the purposes, uh, again, for the purpose of the calculation of AMT is increased from 0%, where they were not included at all before, to now 30%. So as you can see, apart from the basic exemption that is increasing, everything else, every other change that the government is making is essentially penalizing for the majority of the clients that you have. So I've got a table here that summarizes all the changes that I just showed you here and shows the comparative between the current measure that we have right now, how the AMT is computed with these elements and what the changes are going to be for 2024. So you have a nice comparative table here. Of course, this presentation is included with a package that you get with Synergy. So you have access uh, to all of this. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of the deductions are being limited to 50% under this new rule. So you see the list of deductions right here, employment expenses, uh, deductions under CPP, moving expenses, childcare expenses, basically the whole lot of them, Northern residency deductions, uh, you know, capital loss, carry forward, so on and so forth. So a lot of these are being limited to 50% now under the new calculation. 
Uh, under Note 2, almost all the non-refundable tax credits will be reduced uh, to 50% under this new measure uh, with certain exceptions. So pretty much every single non-refundable tax credit that's there that is being used for the computation of AMT. So you know when you look at uh, the T691, you're going to notice that you got basically the sum of all the non-refundable tax credits. That's basically cut in half, essentially, with the exception of certain amounts. For example, the special foreign tax credit. Okay, uh, and uh, certain other non refundable tax credits uh, are still going to be continued to be disallowed in full as they were before, which would be the political contribution tax credit, labor sponsored venture uh, tax credit, and the non refundable portion of the investment tax credit or ITC. Finally, trusts that are currently exempt from AMT will continue to be exempt. And as I mentioned before, this measure uh, will be will be will be applied by the federal government starting in the 2024 tax year. Again, I felt it was important to show you those changes as of now because, of course, you know 2023 is ending. 2024 is about to start in a month. I'm sure you have a lot of tax planning to do with your corporate clients in this case, who are paying themselves in dividends, for example, uh, or who are selling shares of their private corporations, these changes will have a profound effect on the tax planning that you're doing with those clients. So now we get to the CPP additional component or additional contributions that will be required starting in 2024. So I'm giving you the preview of this that was already announced by the federal government recently. So starting in 2024, we will essentially have two components of uh, pensionable contributions made for the CPP. So we will have, of course, the basic uh, the basic uh, amount, which is set at 5.95% up to the maximum limit that we already know of, which is uh, set at 68500 for 2024, but then there will be a second component or an additional range for any earnings that are gained above the maximum limit set for 2024, which is, uh, which again, as I mentioned, is set at 68500 and up to 73200 which will be the upper ceiling of this additional range, again, set for 2024. So ordinarily, earnings between 3500 and 68 8,500 are charged 5.95% uh, to the employee. And of course, the same amount is being charged to the employer for a combined rate of 11.9% of contributions. What the government is doing now for any earnings made by the employees between 68,500 and 73,200, the government is going to charge an additional 8% on those earnings as additional CPP contributions. So this will again be split evenly employer employee, which means for employees, it will be 4% and for employers, it will be 4%. Now that rate will quickly jump from 2024 to 2025 from 8% to 14%. So that's going to jump from one year to the next. Okay. Now what this will mean for these uh, contributors is that they will receive additional CPP uh, pension amounts when they retire later on because they are making those additional contributions. Now the CPP two as it's called here, as, as, as what I've called it here in the slide uh, will be claimed as a deduction on the tax return. So now we're going to look at two measures that are expiring for the personal tax side for 2023. The first one we have is home office expenses. The temporary flat rate method is going to be gone. So there's no longer going to be, uh, you know, the, I guess we called it, you know, commonly we called it in, in tax circles, like the simplified method. This is now gone. So regardless of the reason your customer is working from home now, uh, now the, 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 you know, the original rules or the basic rules apply when it comes to home office expenses, which was under what, what the government called previously the detailed method. So now those criteria have to apply, which means of course that, that uh, a conditions of employment would be required from the employers in order to be able to claim home office expenses for those employees. Whereas the temporary flat rate method did away with that red tape where you didn't need all that criteria. All you needed was a number of days that you, that, that, that the employee worked due to COVID at home for at least for more than 50% of the time. Now, uh, unfortunately for those individuals, they go to the old rules essentially, and now they will need a conditions of employment from their employer in order to claim the detailed method of the home office expenses. So they'll, they'll need now to also keep their receipts and uh, provide you with all their detailed expenses. 
The next measure to expire for the tax year 2023 is the air quality improvement tax credit. So this was basically a temporary measure that the government enacted uh, for 2022 only on the personal side. It was also applicable for corporations. It is also expired for them as well. It was only for year ends that were within 2022. Very simply put, these were essentially, uh, it was a credit uh, that was given uh, to uh, whether it was self-employed individuals or corporations uh, that uh, uh, basically paid for equipment or filters uh, that improve the air quality of their uh, qualifying building, which was essentially uh, a business use building in this case. So this measure has expired as well for 2023. So we just completed uh, the personal tax changes, okay, these are the, the majority of them. There's a few more likely, but these were the more important ones uh, that I wanted to present to you uh, in this presentation. Now we're going to look at some corporate tax changes that are coming. And one very important one, one big one that the government had announced that recently they made a second amendment to, they had made an amendment to uh, a specific rule, a specific uh, article in the act a couple of years ago. When, and now the government is making a second amendment to these rules. And that is what we call the intergenerational generational transfers. So for those of you who are not aware what we mean by intergenerational transfers, very simply put what it is is, you know, you have a business owner who owns shares in a family corporation, wants to now pass on those shares to the next generation to their children. Well, they tr what the way they will do it is through a lot of times the the, the main technique will be an, what we call an estate freeze, uh, where essentially they would sell their shares uh, to uh, their children in order to lock in uh, their lock in the uh, capital gains exemption in this case because more more likely than not the shares that they own in the company would meet the three eligibility criteria for the capital gains deduction in order for them to be considered qualified small business corporation shares so due to this uh, they would collect the capital gains deduction and then simply you know purchase. Uh, uh, a different class of shares of the corporation uh, in order to continue being involved in the business, but they want to be able to pass on the main shares and lock in the capital gains deduction uh, of the original shares or the main operating shares of the company. This is what we call, of course, crystallization of the capital gains deduction and what we call an estate freeze. This is a typical technique of an estate freeze. For those of you who are not aware how an estate freeze works, you can go directly to our website, uh, dtmax.ca, uh, and we've written uh, uh, several blog articles on techniques. First of all, the explanation of what an estate freeze is, uh, and then techniques that individuals will use in order to be tax efficient in their estate freezes, in, in order to crystallize their capital gains deduction. In other words, to lock in the capital gains deduction and pass on in a tax efficient way way the shares or you know the, the 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 torch or the shares of the corporation to their children that's the technique now there were some anti tax avoidance measures that the government enacted in order uh, in order to prevent, you know, some of the more abusive tax planning and estate freezing. And one of these measures was section 84.1 of the income tax act or what's called surplus stripping. So when these shares would be exchanged in this case, sometimes it would be an exchange of shares or, or sometimes it would be a donation, or sometimes it's just a direct sale uh, to the children. The moment these shares would, would be passed on from uh, the owner of the company to their children, well then what would happen is this would be deemed an arm's length transaction from the main shareholder to their children, and this would enact or trigger section 84.1 of the act because the government deemed this as abusive tax planning. Because of course, by exchanging the shares, by making that exchange from the uh, elder person of the family to their children, to the next generation, they will not have much of a tax consequence when the shares of the that, that they're being exchanged of the corporation are eligible in this case for the capital gains deduction. So they make the exchange and there's barely any tax consequences. Maybe AMT might get triggered, but AMT is not a high tax rate in either case. So 
what would happen is the government deemed this as abusive because they would do this exchange of shares with the children and there would be barely any tax consequence for the person who's exchanging the shares, who's selling the shares, who's passing on the shares to the children. So the, so the government enacted this specific rule, which is ITA 84.1, which is what they call surplus stripping. So now, what is surplus stripping? Let's understand it. So I'm going to skip a little bit and then come back to what the government uh, changed as far as what surplus stripping is. Let's understand first what surplus stripping was. What was the government, what's the anti-avoidance rule the government had enacted under 84.1? Well, what they were doing was essentially they would prevent the withdrawing of profits generated by the corporation through a tax-preferred return on capital instead of taxable dividend. For example, an exchange of shares from an operating company to a holding company owned by related persons for the purposes of crystallizing capital gains deduction. So this would be a typical technique of an estate freeze. Okay, this would be a typical technique. So what would happen here is you have, for example, Opco and you have Holdco. Okay, let's take an exa as an example. All right, so the individual who owns... Opco wants to pass on the shares of Opco to Holdco, which is owned by their children. So essentially, they want to pass on the company to their children. So what they're doing essentially is making an exchange of the shares. So what they're doing is the, uh, the, the parent in this case is giving shares of Opco in exchange for shares of Holdco. And by doing that, they trigger a disposition. And by triggering that disposition, if Opco in this case, is eligible for the capital gains deduction, well, then that exchange of shares, there's barely any tax consequence. In theory, there's no tax consequence. Now, AMT might trigger, depending on the amount, but in general, there would be no tax consequence. They would be able to collect the capital gains deduction, and then at that point, there's still someone involved in the old company because Holdco owns the shares of Opco, and they're and they become shareholders of Holdco. And now the children now can continue to run the company. So in this case, what was the consequence? What, what would trigger under 84.1? What would trigger under 84.1 is, number one, the paid of capital on the shares that they collect from, in my example, Holdco, would be reduced in this case, there will be a, 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 a reduction, an important one, of the paid-up capital. Of course, that has a profound effect later on when, this, when these shares get sold later on, let's say, to a third party. Secondly, the capital gain that would be triggered with the exchange of the shares would now be considered a dividend. It would be deemed a dividend in this case and not a capital gain. So, of course, this has an important tax consequence. What's the important tax consequence is I can't claim the capital gains deduction. The parent in my example that I, that I just mentioned can no longer trigger the capital gains deduction because it is not deemed a capital gain. It is deemed a dividend. So, of course, this was very penalizing for the parent who was trying to pass on to the next generation their shares of the company, of Opco in my example. So, the conditions that would trigger 84.1 were the six conditions that you see here on the screen. And again, all of this is explained in detail in DT Max, in our DT Max blog. Again, dtmax.ca, click on the blog tab, and you'll see quite a few articles that explain estate freeze, crystallization, techniques of estate freezes, and 84.1 specifically. Okay, it, it'll explain all of it so that it gives you context as to what the government is doing specifically with these amendments. So again, 84.1 would trigger the moment the passing on the shares would be done with a person that was uh, that was at arm's length, meaning it has to be somebody who's related to the person who owns the shares. And the moment that would happen, you trigger 84.1, and unfortunately, your, your now tax-preferred capital gain, which would be tax-free almost, becomes a taxable dividend. So what the government has done, what they, what they did originally in, uh, this would be in 2001, if my memory, uh, 2021, excuse me, if my memory uh, serves me, is that uh, they have amended 
let's go back to the condition. They've amended the fifth condition here that the uh, what's called that you would trigger the rule when the sa- when the shares were sold in this case with a person who was uh, who was not dealing at arm's length. Okay, so who was not uh, no who was uh, what's called who was not dealing at, at, at arm's length with the seller of the shares. So now. They've basically done away with that condition, and from now on, they are going to deem uh, a child who is over 18 as a person who deals with the seller of the shares at arm's length. Okay, that's essentially the change that they made in 2021. And now, by doing, by making that change, now you can sell the shares directly to your child, and you could claim the capital gains deduction because you're no longer triggering 84.1, uh, where the capital gains convert into a dividend. Because now, again, the child who is over 18 is deemed now as somebody who are, you are dealing with at arm's length. So, it's, so you're not triggering condition number five. Condition number five still exists under section 84.1, but now what they deem as a purchaser at arm's length is includes a child that is over 18. So that was the change that they made. They did add one condition though, is that the child who receives those shares cannot sell the shares for 60 months. That was the additional condition they added in 2021. So the moment that exchange of shares happens between the parent and the child, the child has to retain the shares for 60 months. Otherwise, if they sell to a third party within 60 months, then you're triggering 84.1 again. And you know, you're undoing essentially the change that the government have brought about. So now what the government did uh, recently is that they've added a couple of more conditions to the 60 month rule that I just mentioned before. And now what they're doing is that when the transfer happens between the parent and the child, now each one has to jointly elect under two methods of the transfer. Either it is going to be an immediate intergenerational business transfer or what the government calls a three-year test, or it's going to be a gradual intergenerational business transfer, a five to 10-year test based on the traditional estate freeze characteristics. Again, this is what I was mentioning before about estate freezes. So from here, uh, what are the conditions under each one of these tests? So number one, transfer of control of the business. If they choose to elect under the immediate or the three-year test, then the parents immediately and permanently transfer both legal and factual control, including immediate transfer of the majority of voting shares within 36 months. That's that if they choose, if they elect under that. Now, If they choose under the five to 10 year test, then it's only the legal control that they're required to transfer within 36 months, not the factual one in this case. Next, under these conditions, under the election, so you have to meet these conditions uh, if you are, you know, under the under the two elections. So again, under the three-year test, the transfer of economic interest is business. Parents immediately transfer the majority of the common shares within 36 months. Okay, that's under the three-year test. Under the five and 10-year test, parents immediately transfer the majority of common shares and transfer the balance of the common shares within 36 months. In addition, Within 10 years of the initial sales, parents reduce the economic value of their debt and equity interest in the business, 50% of the value of the interest in a farm or fishing corporation, and 30% of the value for a small business corporation, a qualified small business corporation share. So for both of them, again, they're transferring the majority of the common shares, but then any other Equity and that and that's in and so so for under three year test everything transfers all the common shares and everything else transfers within thirty six months while under the t- five to ten year test the common shares transfer but then the economic value of other debt and other equity that they have will, uh, will be progressively transferred within ten years uh, and it'll be at least fifty percent of the value for the for a fishing corporation or a small business uh, qualified small business corporation shares. Now, next, under the transfer of management of the business, again, under the three-year test, the parents transfer the management of the business to their child within the 36-month safe harbor. So it has to be done within 36 months. It's essentially the same rule under the five to 10-year test when it comes to the management of the business. Nothing changes between the two methods. Okay, now, child retains control of the business. The children retain 
legal, not factual control for 36 months period following the share transfer. So they have to be, they have to have the legal rights. Uh, they have to retain the legal rights for at least 36 months of the management of the business. Wow. With the uh, five to 10 year test, that can be done within 60 months. So there's an extension in this case by uh, two years. And then child works in the business. At least one child remains actively involved in the business for 36 months uh, beyond uh, following the transfer, while under the five to 10 year test, it is 60 months in this case. All right, so again, the major distinction for both options is that the transferee remains implicated economically and management-wise in the business for a longer period of time under the gradual method, but not as much transfers right away. Okay, that's, that's basically the difference there. Okay, the rules introduced apply to subsequent shares by the purchaser corporation and the lifetime capital gains exemption are proposed to be replaced by relieving rules, etc. There will be no limit on the value of the shares transferred in reliance upon this rule. So, in other words, so whereas before to claim the capital gains exemption, uh, the pay, the taxable capital of the corporation of the shares that are being sold had to be uh, what's called had to be below ten million. In this case, now they're uh, what's called they're eliminating that limitation. Okay, now the capital gains reserve of 10 years of 10 years would be allowed for these types of intergenerational transfers. So, so there would be a reserve that would be allowed for, uh, that would go up to 10 years and the amendments will take effect as of 2024. So starting on or after January 1st, 2024. So next we've got immediate expensing of depreciable properties. Uh, just be aware that uh, this measure that was enacted in, th uh, in 2021 uh, for uh, corporations, it is still applicable for individuals and uh, partnerships in this case. It is eliminated for any uh, year ends that is beyond December 31st, 2023. So TikTok, if, uh, if, you're, if you've got uh, corporations that still have not, uh, that, that are still active right now till December 31st, 2023, well, you got another month to purchase any assets in order to claim the 100% depreciation expense. Next, uh, air quality improvement tax credit, same thing as on uh, the personal side. Uh, this measure will be eliminated for any tax year that is beyond, any tax year end beyond December 31st, 2022 in this case. So it is already gone essentially. So finally, we get to reporting requirements for trusts. So for trusts that have a taxation year ending beyond December 30, 2023, which means essentially all December 31st, 2023 and on will be uh, this new rule, this new reporting requirement will be applied. So all non-resident trusts that currently have to file a T3 and express trusts that are resident in Canada, with some exceptions, will have to provide additional information when they produce the tax return. Okay, when they produce. So that means essentially that a lot more trusts will have to file a return. Now, what information do they have to report? Okay, what is it that the government is seeking with these new reporting requirements? Well, the subject trusts will have to report the identity of all trustees, beneficiaries, and settlers that, and along with each person who has the ability to exert control or override the trustee decisions over the appointment of income, uh, or capital of the trust and yet to be on a yet to be created schedule. Uh, again, the schedule is being worked on right now by the government. We don't have the number yet, but it will be a new schedule that will be added to the T3 return. So essentially, we'll, it's essentially the government will want a detailed list of all of these trustees, beneficiaries, and settlers that can exert control on the trustee decisions. They're, they were, they're going to want to have their information. So what information do they require uh, starting uh, for year ends uh, on of December 31st, 2023, they require the name, the address, the date of birth, the country of residence, and the tax identifi identification number. So that could be SIN or business number or trust account number, depending on the type of, uh, the type of individual in this case. Finally, the trusts that are exempted from this requirement, you see the list here, it'll be mutual fund trusts, uh, trusts governed by registered plans, in this case, so RSPs, et cetera, et cetera, uh, lawyers, uh, general trust accounts, uh, graduated rate estates and qualified uh, disability trusts. So that's interesting here. That means GREs would not be subject to these rules in this case. Uh, a trust that have been in existence for, le for, for less than three months and trusts that hold less than $50,000 in assets throughout the year. So these are the trusts that would be exempt from this rule. So although not mentioned 
in the introduction of the session. This is literally a last minute add to the presentation. Uh, we've, I've added essentially an other text changes uh, category and you'll see why in a second. It is because we need to talk about the underused housing tax, which is something that we spoke about at length last year, which is a new annual declaration that has to be filed for any what's called affected owner, uh, essentially non-residents who own properties in Canada who are underusing them as per the Canadian government. So what's noteworthy about the underused housing tax and what's changed this year is that the government has extended for a second time the deadline for the 2022 annual declaration. So originally the deadline, and this measure actually started in 2022, uh, the deadline was April 30th, 2022. 2023. So before that deadline, the government decided to extend that deadline to October 31st, 2023. And then we just got the announcement literally last minute, hot off the presses, that the government is again extending the deadline for the 2022 annual declaration, which is the UHT 2900. They're extending it to April 30th, 2024. So again, a reminder of the measure is essentially a 1% tax on the value of the property that is owned by what the government calls an affected owner. Usually it means a non-resident, essentially, uh, a non-resident that is, as per the as per the government's definition, underusing their property in Canada. That's essentially what the underused housing tax is. So as a little reminder, we're just going to go a little bit of a summary of what it is. So remember that it's not everybody that is, a, not every property owner in Canada is affected by the underused housing tax. Like I said, the target is really non-residents that own property uh, in Canada. Canada, but uh, there are, but the government does uh, define what an excluded owner is, and the excluded owner is essentially uh, somebody uh, who is either Canadian citizen or permanent resident of Canada who. Uh, owns a property or a corporation, uh, a Canadian corporation that owns a property, registered charities, uh, you know, a municipality, uh, uh, you know, indigenous governing body, uh, and the different other governing bodies within Canada, whether it's, uh, it's a municipal, uh, provincial, and federal. So if these individuals who are excluded owners, they are not affected owners, meaning they don't pay the underused housing tax, but on top of it, they're not required to file an annual declaration. Now, now, if your client does not fall under the definition of an excluded owner, then they become an affected owner as per the as per the federal government. And these affected owners have to pay ordinarily the underused housing tax, which is the 1% on the property value, on the assessed value of uh, the real estate property that they own. However, they can claim an exemption. There are several exemptions. Uh, to, there are several exemptions to the underused housing tax uh, by but to claim the exemption, they must file the annual declaration and declare the exemption. So an excluded owner does not file anything with the CRA and they don't pay any tax. An affected owner might be exempted from paying the tax, but they're not exempting from uh, they're not exempted from filing the annual declaration. They would have to file every single year and declare the exemption. So very quickly, some of the uh, exemptions that, that the government allows for, for example, qualifying occupancy. So if, for example, the property owner who's an affected owner themselves or somebody related to them, uh, you know, ch children or spouses live in the property for at least six months out of the year, uh, then at that point they are, they fall under the qualifying occupancy exemption. Or if they rent the property during the year to somebody in Canada, it is in this case, uh, a qualifying occupancy. Other exceptions that we're talking about here, uh, is properties not suitable for year round use. For example, they have a cottage somewhere that's not accessible during the winter. That would be an exemption. Uh, the year that they acquire the property is another exemption. Uh, the owner that has died during the year is the, in the year of death. That is also an exemption. A newly constructed property is also an exemption and uh, a property that has been damaged in, let's say, for example, a flood or a fire. That would be another example of an exemption. Now the tax is in and of itself, like I mentioned earlier, is 1% on the assessed value. So essentially this would be uh, either on the, on the, this would essentially be on the property tax. However, what, uh, what these individuals can do is that they can elect 
in this case to base the 1% tax on the fair market value instead of the assessed value on the property taxes. Now, ordinarily, you would say that doesn't make, uh, that wouldn't make any sense because the fair market value will usually be higher than the assessed value. But considering right now where the housing market is with the interest rates that have jumped up, now a lot of the fair market values of the properties have really dropped uh, in the last year. So it could be that the fair market value becomes more interesting than the assessed value on uh, on the property tax. So in that case, uh, they have to bring you know, an evaluator to assess the property and to determine what the fair market value is. The election can be done directly on the UHT 2900. Uh, the government has a prescribed area on the form to perform this election on fair market value. Now, for late filing penalties, of course, this would not be applicable as of right now because the government has extended for a second time the deadline to April 30th, 2024. However, let's assume under ordinary circumstances uh, that uh, the customer is late. Uh, ordinarily, the deadline would be April 30th of the following year. So the same deadline as the tax return. Uh, as the tax return. So if, for example, they are late, uh, let's assume the regular rules apply, uh, then it would be $5,000 dollars the greater of five thousand dollars for an individual owner or ten thousand dollars for somebody who's not an individual a corporation for example and the amount that is the total and it's the greater of the either five or ten thousand or five percent uh of of uh of the tax applicable uh or three percent of the tax applicable uh the amount that the, the, the amount that is a total of Okay, so that would be essentially uh, what the penalty would be. What's unique about the late filing penalties as well is that not only is there a monetary penalty, but there's also a legal penalty. So let me explain what, the, what I mean by a uh, legal penalty. What I mean is the government will claw back some of the exemptions if you are late beyond a certain date. So again, the ordinary deadline is April 30th of the following year, of of the year following the tax year in this case. So for example, the old deadline would have been for 2022 would have been April 30th of 2023. If they don't file the deadline by December 31st of the following year, then not only is there the monetary penalty, but on top of it, there will be a clawback of the exemption. So I call this, I call this a legal penalty in this case. And what the government is doing essentially is they're clawing back the exemptions. So so if you are filing beyond December 31st, so beyond the, that, that, that next calendar year, then they're not going to allow you a qualifying occupancy exemption, uh, you know, uh, uh, the exemption for property not suitable for year-round use, uh, property uninhabitable due to disaster, and exemption for property undergoing major renovation. So the government simply will disallow those exemptions, will not allow the taxpayer to claim those exemptions if they go past December 31st. So we hope you enjoyed this session, that it gives you all the information that you need to start your tax season on the right foot. Thank you for attending Synergy 2023, and thank you for watching. Thank you, Jerry, for this 2023 tax update. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now take a lunch break. Don't forget that our workshops will begin at 2.30 p.m. In the meantime, we invite you to check out the additional video presentations in the workshop area or visit our virtual booths to chat with our staff and guest speakers. At 4.30, we invite you to join Eric Neveu in the general sessions section for the closing statement and the draws. Thank you and enjoy your lunch, everybody.